Thank you. Um, so great to see everyone. Uh, I'm joining you actually from Chicago today, and I know it's early for some of our um, West Coast gang, but we wanted to accommodate um, the time zone. So we're excited. Thanks to PMD Alliance for hosting this and giving us the space to kind of chat about pressing and important topics um, in, in Parkinson's disease. So I'm so excited to have um, uh, Professor Post join us from uh, the Netherlands. He is um, uh, has an expertise in Parkinson's and genetic movement disorders. He's um, based at Radboud um, in Nijmegen, um, and that is a university working with um, uh, other folks that are really doing great work, um, including Boss Blom and uh, such a great team they have there. So we're just excited to have, um, be able to spotlight this concept of um, young onset Parkinson's disease um, or EOPD, now it's called um, early onset Parkinson's disease. So welcome, um, Bart, uh, thank you for joining us. And um, maybe uh, you could also tell us a little bit about who we have joining us as well there. I know she works with you closely and I'll let you yeah. introduce her. Yeah, well, thank you for having us. and. Uh... Well, thank you for the kind introduction. And um, I work here uh, as a neurologist since uh, 10 years, and I'm focused on young onset Parkinson's disease. And since 60 of these things, two years, um, Wilanka Capella, she's a PhD on young onset Parkinson's disease, and she does some incredible work here. She's also working together. We are working together on on making an experience center for young onset Parkinson's disease. We can we come to that later. So, well, maybe you can say something about what inspires you to, to work with our group. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I got inspired because my grandfather has been diagnosed with Parkinson's when he was quite young. Uh, so I really care about the subject and improving care for people with Parkinson's. It's a very practical subject, uh, which I love. And I love collaborating with both patients and uh, carers, um, healthcare professionals. It's really inspiring. Yeah. That's amazing. And you you guys are also working with um, Annelien Oosterban, um, who is a, a person living with Parkinson's as well as an OBGYN. And I know she's just joined your team, uh, Bart. So that's really exciting too. One of the things that I've been really inspired about with the work that you guys are doing is um, including the patient voice, which I think is really important, um, not just in, in young onset or EOPD, which we'll talk a little bit about, but also in general, I think our, all of our work, um, you know, many of us draw inspiration from our patients and have personal connections to Parkinson's and it makes our work all the more um, important uh, when we do include that patient voice. So, so thank you for doing that. Um, so Bart, maybe we'll just start a little bit about what inspired you to do this work actually. Um, and also about the fact that you and um, uh, another colleague of yours have started this task force um, at the Movement Disorder Society. We just all got back from this big meeting in, in Spain um, and we're excited to finally meet together. Um, so tell us a little bit about um, what inspired you to go into this area? Why specifically this younger population? And then um, tell us a little bit about the task force. Yeah, okay. Um, well, the inspiration came from, from, from my career because I started as a, as a neurologist uh, doing my PhD in uh, Parkinson's. And then I switched to child neurology because I was asked to go into child neurology and do movement disorders in child neurology. And I was almost finished my training as a child neurologist. And then Bas Bloom called me and asked me to come back to general neurology. And so I, I just, well, kept these two worlds of child neurology and general neurology of adult neurology. So that's why I got into this young onset patients, children, so juvenile Parkinsonism, but also like in their 20s and in their 30s. So that's how I got involved. And then I met Xander van Ruysen. And later on, we show you his mind map um, because he showed me what's the impact of having Parkinson's at age of 40 or 30 on your family life, on your work. So it's not only about tremor, about this bradykinesia, about rigidity, because that's how I was trained. Something is broke and you have to fix it. And he showed me that there is a lot more impact. And I knew it, but he made this marvelous mind map. And that really changed the way I was thinking. And then we wrote this grant together. So Xander and I wrote the grant and we got like 200,000 euros. And then we start off having this uh, co-creation of care 
I think about seven years ago. And, and from there, it, it all went on. And in the end, we got Wilanka in the team as a PhD. So she's, she's our first PhD, so we're really proud of her. <laughs> and we got Annalene on the team. So we, we just we just built it from this, well, this, well, it, it is my career just changing from child neurology to back to adult neurology. That's where it all started. And then I think Xander as a patient really, well, turned things on. That's amazing. I think we all That's get inspired. There's definitely gaps, right, in this huge field. I think so many of us have focused on motor symptoms in yeah. older white men, largely. And we're just realizing, I think, more and more as we explore and talk to other patients who feel under, underserved, that you know there is a huge number of things that need to be done in not just young people, but also women, um, you know, different populations. So, so, so excited. So teach us a little bit about the task force. Yeah, well, in the task force, it was, uh, we were asked to say something about the cutoff age. So in the end, we chose 50 and lower. But in practice, well, it's for research. And we had this great paper coming out about why it should be 50 and lower. And I think one of the most important things to keep in mind is that young onset Parkinson's disease patients have a slower progression than older onsets. So I think in, in, in Dutch, we call it the, the paradox of getting young onsets because you get it at a younger age but you, 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 your progression is slower so you can live at a higher quality of life level than when you get it older but you're sick like for 20 or 25 years in, in your life so it's no choice to have it at a young age but it's like a paradox getting it. So there's and definitely hope. Yeah, there's hope. Yeah, I think especially in this young onset patient to participate in in well in your country, in your in your work, to 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 participate in in life. Uh, there there are much more chances in young onset, but it's also well you have to approach the 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 the, the, the people in another way as as a as a physician. But Wilanka will come to that later. So I think the task force this was asked to just discuss the age cutoff of 50 and lower, why we chose that. But I think that's really important for research, but in clinical practice, you should look at the patient about what their needs are. And sometimes in the Netherlands, we have people of like 45 or 50 who are already grandparents. But we also have people who are 50 or who have a family with, with uh, little children. So the needs can be the same for someone of 40 and 55. So in clinical practice, we don't use this age cut up for 50. We really use it for, for research, of course, because then we have this good cohorts from where we can extrapolate our, our data to, well, to discussions like this. Yeah. So I yeah. think that that's, so it's, it's an important paper will come out, but especially for research, I think. Yeah. Well, I think it's good just to have some criteria just so that we can enroll people and, and, yeah. and gather more attention, but I think the bottom line is that most patients or people living with Parkinson's, you have to customize anyway, right? Because yeah. many people are um, very biologically young. I have in LA people in their 80s who act like they're 50 and, and people who are 60 yeah. that look like, you know, maybe not. So so I think everyone's very different. Um, and I think, you know, meeting people where they are and understanding their needs. And I think, again, you've mentioned quality of life a few times. So I think that those are all very, very key um, issues. Um, I think that, you know, it'd be great to learn a little bit about your center and sort of the work um, that you guys are doing. Um, and also maybe even Bart, um, I think a little bit about the genetics, because I know that that is something that you've been interested in as well. Maybe, you know, we can talk about that after you've described your center, but I definitely want, I know patient people have questions around that as well. So, so maybe okay. we can show your slides and, and then get, get yeah. some audience questions as well. Yeah, well, I will give the word to Wilanka and we share some slides. I will... I hope you can all see the slide yep. deck. Yep. Okay. Well, I'll give the word to Wilanka. Right. So in our center, we are trying to care for people with young onset Parkinson's and their caregivers, of course. And this was inspired by the mind map that Bart just mentioned. Uh, this is it in Dutch. So you probably won't be able to understand it. 
um, but it describes all the aspects in which young onset Parkinson's impacts your life. And in the center, the red lines, you can see where it all comes together and where healthcare might impact this impact on life. So what we can do. This mind map has traveled all over the world. So there's a translation in English and in Chinese now. So uh, we went international. And from that mind map, we learned a lot. So we looked at the impact that young onset Parkinson's had on life. And there are two things that really stand out. Um, the first is women and young onset Parkinson's. Uh, so there's a huge gap in knowledge about how to adequately treat young women who get diagnosed. And this was a review that was written. And it was the, uh, the article that was written by Indu, as you can see, and Annelien Oosterbaum, who is collaborating with us at our center, uh, describing the unmet needs of women living with Parkinson's disease in general. One of the things that I like to focus on is pregnancy and uh, young onset Parkinson's disease because we don't really know how to um, how to um, how to guide women who get pregnant uh, and are already diagnosed. So there's a few articles that were written about this, and the general conclusion is that most women who get diagnosed knows with young onset Parkinson's and get pregnant afterwards experience a worsening of the Parkinson's symptoms during pregnancy. However, this is only based on case reports that were written and retros retrospective studies, but there are no real cohorts. And there's a, there are various uh, explanations for the fact that the PD symptoms might worsen. We're not sure why that is. So of course, when you get pregnant, it has a huge impact on your body. So stress might play a role, but uh, we also don't know much about whether women um, still take their Parkinson's medication during their pregnancy, which if they stop taking their medication might also result in a worsening of the symptoms. Um, and that's the main question that we get uh, in practice is, can I still take my medication when I get pregnant? So in conclusion, not much is known about this topic yet, and we're trying to fix that. So at this point, um, we're collaborating with Cardiff University and the Mayo Clinic to build a registry for women who uh, get pregnant while already being diagnosed with PD, where we want to track everything, um, how they go through their pregnancy. I'm doing that with Bart and with Anneline, and we're building this registry right now, and we're hoping to spread this all across the world, because in the Netherlands, we'll only get a very small cohort, but we want to extend it to the rest of the world to gather as many data as possible and be able to actually say something about this topic. The second topic that we're focusing on here is work and PD. Um, and we know that uh, the median age um, when people stop working after being diagnosed is six years, which is very quickly. Um, and 46% of people have already stopped working after five years of being diagnosed. Um, and we know that working is a large part of people's identity and might improve their quality of life in various ways. It helps them to stay active, to be able to connect to peers. So this is a problem that we don't know much about yet. Um, one article describes the factors that impact uh, uh, stopping uh, with, uh, with work. And uh, this is based on both internal and external factors we know. So it's based both on coping strategies that a patient has, but also on uh, the support that's given by a manager, for example, or colleagues. Um, and these are ways that might uh, influence when people stop working or if they stay in a workplace. All these things are described in a review that Bart wrote. Um, so if you want to know more then please read this review. But right now I want to focus on 
what we're doing within our center to actually improve those issues. So at this moment, we're trying to build a new experience center or center of expertise for young people with Parkinson's disease. And we're doing this using co-creation. So what's co-creation? It's collaborating in equal collaboration and mutual respect between all parties involved in a healthcare innovation. So in our case, that's people with Parkinson's, uh, they're professional caregivers, so healthcare professionals and uh, their personal caregivers at home. Um, we're doing this within two projects. So we're working on YOPEC, the Young Onset Parkinson's Expert Center, and Zorg for Parkinson, which is another healthcare innovation project within the Rappag GMC. And this is a technique that has already been used in product development for quite some time, but is quite new in uh, healthcare innovations. What does that look like? Uh, at the moment, we have a core team in which me, Bart, Anneline, um, and uh, some patients and uh, carers are involved. And we have four different teams that we are working on. So that's lifestyle, lifestyle and vitality, caregiver and child, woman and PD, and an online platform for young and Parkinson. And from all these teams, there's one person who is involved in the core team. How does one of those teams work? Um, for example, if we take the online platform Young and Parkinson, the goal is to build a website where um, all information is gathered about young onset Parkinson's disease, where people can meet each other, where they can find, for example, which sports to play or how to find each other um, uh, nearby. Um, and uh, in this team, um, we have people with young onset Parkinson's participating, but also caregiv uh, caregivers, healthcare professionals, and someone from the D Dutch Parkinson's Association. And we're using each other's expert opinion in these groups. And that's not just the perspective you bring as a patient, but we also try to involve, for example, people who worked in ICT or know a lot about communication to collaborate on these teams. We have monthly meetings with no traditional chair because each voice has to be equally important. So my voice is not more important than a patient's voice or uh, uh, a caregiver's choice. And we have a common workspace in teams where we can share all our information with each other. Because this is a relatively new way of working, we're trying to uh, evaluate this process. Um, you don't have to really understand this graph, but what we're doing is we're trying to investigate through surveys uh, and interviews whether people experience uh, this co-creation process as uh, helpful or not, which still needs to improve. And after three months, we try to put the information that we gathered back into the teams to kind of iteratively improve this process of collaborating. Eventually, we're working towards this structure, the hubs and spokes. So you see the really large purple circle, which is the hub. Um, and that's where all the experts uh, knowledge is. So that's where we are or center where you can find all care for people with Parkinson's disease. And then we also want the spoke. So going to the regions where people live themselves so that you can find uh, adequate uh, healthcare nearby. So people from the other side of the country don't have to travel to the to Nijmegen, to uh, the Rabat University to get the care that they need and deserve. And this is our core management team. So as you can see, there's Mark. He has uh, PD Anneline, who is working as a gynecologist and also one of our uh, patient participants. We have a Parkinson's nurse. We have Bart, a neurologist. Alexander, who has a father with PD. Then me as a researcher. 
um, a physical therapist, Alexander van Ruysen, who designs the mind map. And eventually, this is what we want. We want the experience center where we can find everything. Someone who gives boxing lessons, someone who can look at your diet, someone who can help you with your work, where you can see a neuro neurologist and where you can find all the care that you need gathered in one place. And some place that doesn't look like a hospital, but looks like a cozy place to meet each other. This is the dream that we're working towards. Yeah. And that's my story. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I hope to come and sit on that couch and hang out with you guys someday. Yeah, well, <laughs> feel free to come over. We we try to arrange something to get you over and you just share all the work you do here and just see what we do. I but in the end, I think it's important that, well, Wilanka, thank you for this excellent talk. And in the end, it's not about, about the environment. It, it, this is just... This is just what we want in um, the uh, embodiment. Yeah, the embodiment. So it, it's it's about the people that work in here that give this care on an equal way. That that's what we want. And in the end, we want the couch, but it's more important to get the people who give this good care to young onsets. And we have a lot of those people already in, but it can also be better. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, well, maybe we can stop sharing the screen for a second. Yeah, you can always refer back to those slides, but I, I think that this is such an important sort of um, embodiment is, is a really good word. So, you know, I think historically we've had the model of a person, you know, getting a, a symptoms, coming into a place, seeing a doctor in a white coat in a place that, you know, is the one time visit, go home with a pill maybe, um, and then figure out kind of by themselves what they should do every day or not come back in six months and sometimes feel alone, feel yeah. sometimes the journey even to get to you took time, maybe, you know, a year or two to find the right diagnosis or sometimes more some of the women, some of the younger patients, because we don't have a good sense of who can get Parkinson's and the, the sort of picture in people's brains um, worldwide is of an older, you know, white old man stooped over maybe he was in his 70s or 80s many of these diagnoses are delayed so um you know i think that this sort of sense of welcoming somebody helping them connect with other people um that may be like them hearing their voice understanding their journey and then understanding what their hopes and dreams are for the future and what matters to them is really key and then working with them to allow them to to do that um you know and successfully I think this is, you know, a dream uh, situation, but I think, you know, we're getting hopefully energy in the world to understand that this needs to be done in a different way than what I first described. So I think, you know, there's sort of the, the dream and then reality, but there are many places in between. Um, so I think that, you know, getting the task force as a first step to help movement disorders, doctors know that this is important and yeah. writing these papers is, you know, of, of gaps and, and sort of an approach is so important getting the patients together and especially in the virtual way, um, being able to connect people is so exciting. Um, I think these are, you know, steps that all of us can take, you know, who are doing some of this work is to help connect patients, um, people living with Parkinson's or younger, because it's pretty clear that their needs are quite different. Um, and I've had people who, you know, go to the local support group and see only older people and don't resonate with any of them, um, you know, yeah. as, as people living with Parkinson's. So I think that's all, you know, really important. Um, what are some first steps, Bart? Like what, so you've taken care of older people with Parkinson's. You've taken yeah, care of a lot. Yeah. If you met somebody today who was, let's say 50 or 40, 45, 40, 45 ish year old ish, uh, year old Indian woman comes in to see you um, living in the Netherlands. What would you tell me? And what are the first steps as part of my interaction with you? What would be different? Yeah, as, as, a, as a PD patient, for instance. Huh? Yeah, well, I think the most important what we do in the beginning is just, well, the, the most important question I get as a, as a neurologist, the first question I get, is it really Parkinson's? So that's the first thing. We try to find out whether it's really Parkinson's. And if it's Parkinson's, we try to explain to them how the disease progresses 
what we can do. So we give them hope. And it's not false hope, but it's re re realistic hope about how the next years were going to look like. And especially this first year, um, it's hard to cope with the disease and try to get it into your life. So one of the first things I say is that we have patients who've already been there, who said to me, we have this list of patients who want to share their experience with this new person. So like Annalene, she does a lot of contact with new women who get this diagnosis. So Annalene says to me, if someone wants to talk to me, you just give her my number and I will talk to them. So after getting diagnosed, we, we give a lot of explanation about the disease and we, 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 we answer a lot of questions. But we always say to the patients, men, women, that there are other patients who have already been there and they want to connect like a peer support. And a lot of people, they want it. Maybe not at the first meet, not the first time we meet, but then in, in two or three months when we have seen them several times, a lot of people ask for it. So I think that that's one of the first things I would, I, I would add to, um, well, it's not usual care, but we, 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 we do it. And a lot of people, they, well, they really, uh, they, they, they go good with it. So, so I think that's one of the first thing. And then the other thing we, we get a lot of questions about is work. Uh, Wilank already said something about it. And we have this, uh, yeah, in, in, in the Netherlands, we have this uh, medical specialist who is trained to talk to patients about uh, yeah, staying on work or staying in work. I don't know if you have it in the US, but in the Netherlands, we have it. This, so medical specialist is like a neurologist and he can talk to people about well, staying at work, um, about energy levels, about, well, how you can just, uh, oh, maybe you can, maybe you can help me, Rilanka, because Rilanka is doing research on it now. Yeah. So maybe she can explain a little bit more. So, but we, we have this, you explain it in a moment, but we have this specialist in our team. So we can send people to her, but, but maybe, maybe you can say something about this yeah. medical specialty. So I think the right translation would be the an occupational medicine specialist. Thank you, Wilang. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he helps people with problems at work, as, uh, as Bart says, and he kind of helps people from the moment they get diagnosed until the moment they want to stop working. And besides from knowing everything about Parkinson's and all the medical aspects, he also knows a lot about the rules and the rights that someone has in the workplace. So he can kind of um, be the connection between the medical field and the work field, which helps a lot of people to who want to stay at work to stay in a workplace, but also people who want to stop working to uh, stop working in the right way that's most beneficial to them. Yeah, I mean, that's so key. We don't have that specialty necessarily here. We have um, rehab doctors that, you know, do physical medicine and rehab, um, work with physical therapists and stuff. We have occupational therapists that are able to assess people and, um, you know, help them do either modifications with um, movements or assistive devices and things like that. Um, for specific activities, but there isn't exactly, uh, we have occupational medicine, but largely they're talking about things like if I had a needle stick injury, you know, yeah. with uh, mm -hmm. like at work or something, how to prevent uh, infections or things like that. It's not really what you're talking about. I think it's a, it's a specialty that is missing here um, in, in the United States and in Canada as well, where I trained. I don't think we have exactly that. Somebody's written here, vocational rehab, Mark has written that. So um, yeah, but it's it. I think for every patient to meet somebody like that and to be able to sit down and talk about you know their current job and what they wanna to try to continue to do um, moving forward is, is actually very proactive. Um, a lot of what you've talked about is actually a very proactive approach, which I think yeah. historically, in um, medicine and, and in Parkinson's, my feeling is that we've been very reactionary. So um, the I things agree. that I really enjoyed hearing about with your center um, and the people that you have at least uh, been talking to are the fact that you have a sense of incorporating um, this occupational piece 
um, specifically also looking at women's issues with the OBGYNs, which I think normally these are siloed, you know, we have the patient as the mediator between their OBs and then they come see us as neurologists separately. We're rarely yeah. in the same place. Um, the mental health piece, I think, is also huge, and maybe I'll have you speak a little bit about that as well, um, the psychologists that you work with, but I think I personally have realized that mental health is such a part of Parkinson's, and having a good way to assess that from diagnosis possibly and plugging people in to the social support, as you mentioned, um, but also if there's issues um, that come along having mental health um, uh, folks, it may not be a psychiatrist, but a psychologist or other providers, I think is also very helpful, um, you know, as, as part of it. And um, and then I also want to speak to you a little bit. Um, maybe we'll talk about the mental health piece and then I'll, I'll ask you. Yeah. yeah, well, I think it's it's really important. I think in, in the US, you have like social workers and maybe they do something with work because uh, when I was in Toronto and also uh, when I was in the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, I think social work did a lot of, a lot of, things uh, with people getting uh, of staying people helping people to stay at work um well talking about the um, uh, psychological needs or the neuropsychiatric features of young onset parkinson's well in our team we have this psychiatrist we have this um, nurse practitioner of the psychiatry we have our social worker that's really important and we have this um specialist and it's really special is sees a specialist in mindfulness and a psychiatrist and we have this mindfulness center in our academic university hospital and we can we can send people over there to be trained in coping with their parkinson's and learning mindfulness to use to treat their own parkinson's and especially rick helmick you already mentioned him he's a neurologist in our team you know him because you discussed with him about his research and he's doing a lot of research on stress. And well, like you all know, I think uh, stress will aggravate symptoms of Parkinson's. And by uh, learning to cope with stress, you can um, treat your own uh, symptoms. So that's a way of dealing with stress we have here and we use for our patients. So I think that that's unique in the Netherlands. I don't know how it is in the world that we have incorporated mindfulness in an academic hospital and that we have this uh, really nice uh, professor in psychiatry who's doing a lot of research to incorporate this in normal practice because in the Netherlands it's still looked at if if it's not real research I know what you mean I hope you know what I mean yes um, but it's really important way of of, of living with the disease and, and coping with stress because stress is 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 a is a big problem for um, for Parkinson's disease patients. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think one of the things that's really exciting is that sort of um, I can't remember uh, Lanka you put on that slide. It was like vitality and um, something up there, but it was sort of this lifestyle. Yeah, lifestyle, right? Yeah. So um, it's more this holistic way of looking at the person and everything around them, which I really like. I think the model is that the patients in the center, you have the caregivers, which you include the professional ones, uh, which is, you know, would be all the people that touch the patient along with the, the people that are in, in their family and community, which I think is really important. Um, and then sort of this multidisciplinary approach, which I think is also so key because I think we as doctors sometimes get overwhelmed. We can't do all of these things in one visit. Yeah. And some That's of the patients really that are listening right now might be saying, well, I'm in, you know, somewhere rural in, in the US and I have access to a neurologist. It may not even be a movement disorder specialist and I'm young and I'm trying my best to get, you know, piece this together. What do I do? You know, what's yeah. the practical approach? But I think the messages that I think are important for everybody, and this isn't just even for young people living with Parkinson's, because I really think that, um, uh, you know, I'm energetically a bit different than my age would define right now in my life, you know, and, and so are many of our patients, you know, so I think it's really about, um, you know, what you hope to do, your quality of life, what you love to do, and trying to maintain that. Um, and so, 
what I think the proactive approach, thinking about the people that you are surrounded by and getting a good circle of those people, it's pretty clear that people don't do well when they're alone, right? So you said from diagnosis, connect them with somebody else who may be able yeah. to inspire them and help them. Um, think about the holistic person, not just your tremor, but also think about the mental health piece. So anyone that can help enrich that, the lifestyle piece, which, which we're going to focus on next, um, you know, these other things. So the things that bring you joy and meaning. So if work is part of that, how do we keep you at work? And so maybe if you're in the US, you need a social worker or an occupational therapist or, you know, just talking about it, worrying about, you know, these things by yourself is not helpful. So if you, um, you know, are having trouble bringing it up, being able to talk to somebody, um, you know, a friend about, you know, some of these fears or a family member, start to really, you know, get a sense of who may be able to help assist you. And, you know, you might be able to piece it together, even if you don't have, you know, this beautiful center with those gorgeous couches in, in the Netherlands. Maybe <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of these sort of inspirations to help ourselves right now. And hopefully yeah, we can agree. work together, um, Bart, with your team. Um, I'm really, you know, cheerleading for this, um, you know, given the gaps that we've identified in so many populations um, to really sort of move the needle into now incorporating some of this, you know, everywhere. And, and I think Boss has cheerleaded this from a physical therapy perspective, right? So he's done the work to say, um, you know, in the Netherlands, that if you do physical therapy from possibly day one of diagnosis, that you have less chance of hip fractures and it saves money and, yeah. you know, hospitalizations overall. My yeah. hope is to work with people like you to build a model where we're proactively meeting people from day one and inspiring them with these messages of hope and the things that are going to make a difference for them over the trajectory so that we can prevent hopefully things happening that we can, you know, rather than just reacting to something that's happened, we give people an education, knowledge, people who can support them, people who are like them to talk to, and then proactively work on um, these things that are important and cater that to the person that's living there in front of us that could be very different needs than, you know, everybody else who we're taking care of in, in that rural place. So, so I think all of these messages can be distilled a little bit. Um, one question I have, so what is the secret sauce part? So you meet two people, let's say that are in their forties today yeah. and they look kind of the same and they walk in and you're going to follow those people in your center for 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. What is the difference between the person that does really well and the person who doesn't do well? What, what is your sense from day one as, as yeah. you know, the types of things that we can we predict who's going to do well or yeah. you know de depending on what you teach them what's going to what's going to what's that secret sauce teach me about that well, i think that one of the most neglected things in treating this patient is how they cope how they cope in life with this well this 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 thing as parkinson's is that comes in your way how do you incorporate it in your life and we try to help them to cope with it, like with act and um, acceptance and commitment therapy, like ACT, yeah, from psychiatry, psychology. Um, but also I try to, but I think that that's the most important. Like how do they cope? And we help them to cope with it in a positive way. So we, again, this hope for the future and 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 looking together with the patient, what what are their needs? What's really important for them? in their lives what are their questions to us so that's another i think it again it's the, this proactive approach of starting with the needs and what what we also see is that the classical doctor stays in, in well is only focusing on like tremor bradykinesia rigidity and then a physical therapist is only focusing on freezing and a psychiatrist is only focusing on depression and then the uh, uh, occupational therapist is only focusing on hand function. And that's why, and maybe we can say something about it. We are working at the moment on a role that we call the integrated care supporter. And well, maybe you can explain what we mean by that. Yeah. So the integrated care supporter is not a new medical professional but a new role for an already existing professional so for example your parkinson's nurse and um, this role uh, 
should be that uh, he or she looks as at the patient as a whole, um, at the patient and uh, the entire family situation. So if someone has a partner or children, those should also be taken into consideration. Um, and he will, for example, use the mind map made by Xander to, um, to paint a picture of what's important to the patient. Like, what do you still want to do in your everyday life? Do you want to keep working? Do you want to play sports? Do you want to spend time with your family? What's important to you? Because people get overwhelmed when they get diagnosed. They have to do so much, some, so much changes that they don't really know where to start anymore. And uh, the integrated care supporter is not going to treat the patient, but is going to guide him or her to the right points to get what they need. So if they need uh, to go to a physical therapist, they will help. But also if they need uh, help at work, they will go to the person that they will send them to the person that they need. Um, they will send a letter to the school of the kids, um, whatever needs to be done, but they won't treat the patient. They will just guide them through the trajectory uh, that they need to get where they want to be. Hmm. So they can like meet this person once a year talk about the mind map and just get new focuses and be proactive to life. I think that's what we're trying to, to build. And then we're trying to do the research together with boss to evaluate whether we get better quality of life, because if it doesn't add to the quality of life as we, well, if we think it should, then we should not, well, then we should not incorporate it in our system. But if it really adds quality of life, then we ask our insurance company to just, well, pay for this role and get this into our system. So that's mm -hmm. what we try to do together with Boss. Yeah. Yeah, that's so important. Um, so it sounds like, you know, this vitality lifestyle stuff is also pretty key. Yeah. And as you know, um, I'm really interested in that. And I'm also so excited to hear about the mindfulness being incorporated in the clinic by a doctor who's also trained in that as something that's really, you know, part of the medicine. So yeah. maybe we can spend some time and um, certainly folks out there, um, if you want to type uh, questions that you may have just in general about this area um, that you'd like to hear from the team here, that would be great as well. Um, so, so tell me a little bit about what you think from a lifestyle perspective from day one patients should be focusing on. Yeah, we have this in Dutch, we call it fish. It's like fish, but it's, it's um, fooding. So like food is important. Diet. Uh, yeah. Inspanning, exercise and stress reduction. So we always tell this patient in the first year that they can do three things themselves. Stress reduction, we already talked about, for example, mindfulness, exercise. We say to them that at least three times a week, 45 minutes to work out, get some transpiration, get your heart beat up and well, do things like uh, spinning or running or rowing, things like that. And then the, the, the third thing is like, look at your food. So look at interaction between medication and food, but also look at healthy food. And so we try to train them in those three things. I think that that's the most important thing at the moment. That's some evidence for. So we train them in those three things, I think. Yeah. And it also sounds like you try to connect them socially with people. Yeah. 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 That, that's what we do in every effort. We try to connect them with peers and we do that for patients, but we also do it for caregivers. We also do it for children. Sometimes, especially on Friday, Fridays at the end of the end of the week, uh, families come in and I talk to the whole family and I, uh, I have um, uh, children of people. Uh, People with Parkinson's, they can ask me questions. So we have eight, 10, 12 year olds, but also sometimes 18, 20, 24 year olds who, have, who are studying medicine, who want to come in and talk to me about it, their parents or their father or their mother and have a lot of questions. So we, we make time for that also. So to, and, and we try to connect all those people together if they want, only if they want. A lot of people, they don't want to connect to others, but we, we, we try to um, encourage them to do it because we know it will help them. A lot of people 
they 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 say it will help them. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've been um, pretty impressed with the importance of social connection. And I yeah. think you know, with um, the pandemic, people have become pretty isolated. Yeah. And I think when you get a diagnosis or start to have symptoms that don't make you feel well, um, or make you feel different or have visible sort of, um, you know, outward symptoms, people tend to feel honestly quite um, ashamed sometimes. And, and um, sometimes, you know, especially women I, we've talked to um, feel like it affects their sense of self. So there's a, a big stigma um, yeah. about the diagnosis. And a lot of people don't even know what it is at first. And then when they get the diagnosis, they, because so much um, publicly is seen with only people that are very sick uh, with Parkinson's, I think part of the problem is also that the people who are healthier that are doing well are not visible because they're doing well and going about their lives. So automatically, sometimes when people get diagnosed and they're young, there's a sort of mental image of again, those same pictures that we have in our minds of who gets Parkinson's. And so I think then there's a sort of extrapolation sometimes of, you know, this is going to be, you know, a very horrible, you know, progression and disease. And so that hope message is so important. And I think also connecting with people that are doing well and that people need to come together who are doing well to support each other, because that is honestly the majority of many of our patients are actually yeah. doing very well. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I agree with you. And it's also very important. And well, we try to do that in several ways, like this way, or Annalene and I were interviewed by this Dutch uh, television channel to talk about why is young onset PD different from older onset. And we try to, well, we try to do that as much as possible in a good way um, to, to get this message to the people. So, yeah. Yeah. Um so you mentioned about people who may or may not be ready or or want it right so sometimes i think at the beginning it's it's it is overwhelming and we give people a diagnosis and then we start to give them all this information and you know sometimes also try to connect them to a support group and and some people you know it's not it's not it's it's too much so yeah. how do you kind of um approach that when when so you, like how do you ask that question of if people are ready for more information i think it's a balance right between giving trying to be hopeful and helpful and yeah. educating people and then sometimes it's you know not it's it's like you know so when do you reapproach it things like that maybe give me a little sense yeah. of well i think what 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 is really important that um Normally, we see these young onset patients only once a year, or we see them if the patient needs us. So they call us and then we make this appointment. So that's the other way around as it used to be. But in the beginning, we are a little bit more like proactive and we say, in six weeks, you're going to come to us and you're going to see the nurse practitioner who will follow you all through your disease. So, and then in three months, you're coming back to me. So in those first three months, they come to us like three times. So you, you have to, you see them, they talk, they go home, they read things, they write things down, they like email you. We, we have, to, so in the, in the beginning, it's really by like building your relationship is a little bit more intense. And then after that, they just go out in the, in the real world and then we then we see them if they need us, and we we think it it works, and and it's just getting to know your team. So we 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 try to put some effort in that in the beginning, and then this is this is the normal way. But it's, some people say, well, I don't want to come back in six months. I need three months. Say, okay, then you come back in three months. So we try to personalize it. But the beginning, we give more energy to build information, to build relationships, to let them know how they can reach us. And then in the end, we just give it to them and say, well, you just contact us if you need us. And then you, you get scheduled. Yeah, I think you that's have how to- we, That's how we approach it. Yeah. I love that. I love that sort of little bit more intense at the beginning so everybody knows yeah. who everybody is so that then you can kind of act act like you when you need it as a person yeah. living with parkinson's then you can kind of connect with these people um faye here in the audience has a question um what solutions do you offer to professional women with pd who have been mothers on top of being involved in a career who don't have a compassionate caregiver whoa 
that's that's a difficult question well it, it's no it's not so difficult what we try to do again is to connect them and to connect them to other women who um who've already been there and well we have next to Annaline, we have five or six of these women who with their diagnosed five to ten years ago and who want to interact with other people so i think that's really important and well, maybe I don't know what you see because we are we are doing a survey at the moment, and Wilanka is looking into that together with his students. Can you say something about the first results, or is it too early to report that or at the moment, Wilanka? I think it's a little early. I think what I can say is that most people that are involved in the survey are uh, postmenopausal. Um, yeah. So they're a little older, so we're still looking for young people to be yeah. involved in our uh, in our survey. Um, one thing that we definitely see is that um, the people who are still, the women who are still menstruating, that if they experience a change in their Parkinson's symptoms, uh, then it's um, always a week prior to their menstruation. So that's kind of consistent with our hypothesis and what we thought. So it's really cool that it actually shows in our data. Yeah. Um, so I will answer that question too, because it's the <laughs> area that I'm very passionate about as well. So I think that my sense is, Faye and other folks, that there's always a sense that it's your spouse that is going to be the person who's going to be your cheerleader or your support. And I think for women, especially young women who may be moms, who may be women, career women, my history of taking care of patients with Parkinson's for the last 20 plus years is that it's often not the spouse that's going to be your main support. So I think from diagnosis and we've written some tips in a blog and we can share those with you and have, have spoken around this and our paper reflects this too, that it's important that you find a cheerleader um, in your life uh, that is in a tribe possibly of, of, of other people. And it's usually going to be the women in your life that are gonna be that person. So it might yeah. be another woman living with Parkinson's, it might be your sister, it might be your sorority sister, your neighbor, your best friend from high school, but that's who it's gonna be. Similarly for our LGBTQ, LGBTQ community, community um, again, many of our models of care are around older white men who have wives that bring them to visits. So we need to think about the model differently and think about your friends and your friend circle and other people that may not be your spouse in some of these instances. And I think that has to be done proactively possibly from day one, because what ends up happening is people isolate and then they lose those people that could be their main caregiver, supporter, tribe, cheerleader. So that's really yeah. key. And, um, and so connecting with others. There's another question here that I'll, I think we can just address really quickly, which is what is the role of technology in the treatment of EOPD? Um, and I will just say, just so that I can get this in, Bart and um, Vilanka are doing some amazing work there. And we will hopefully be partnering with them over the next several years. And a lot of our young uh, patients living with Parkinson's all over the world have been advocates around some of this work. So the work that Annalian's doing with women, with the registry, we will try to um, bring to the US as well and make a lot of these registries and even some of the surveys, I think, international as we can and share this through the yeah. PMD Alliance, the links. We're working on it um, right now, get it with link, you yes. and Annalian. So. Yeah, and I think the PMD Alliance, are, they, they are lo lovely and will disseminate and we will put it out on Twitter. But I think also, I know that there's been an app that we've been talking about a little bit and some technology yeah. as well. So maybe if you just speak to that and I think we have to wrap up, this is flown by as, as I thought. So yeah. uh, yes, yeah. Bart and Blanca, I'll let you talk about the app. Well, what's really interesting and you know, Richelle, Richelle is from the UK, Richelle Flanagan and and she, she won this hackathon and she got money to build the app. So she built it already and it's about tracking women with YOPD. And I've seen the app, I think, twice now in the last two months, and it looks really promising. So she's going to finish it in the next few months. And then together with Annaline and uh, our center, we try to work together with, with Richelle to uh, get this app into research and to get it to the women in, in the practice. And so we start up with, with, some, with some validation studies. And in the Netherlands, there's this really good platform that is the national e-health living lab it's uh, from professor Chavan. he's from uh from leiden university 
and he, he's, a, he's a professor in e-health and he has a lot of um, experience with this kind of bringing these apps to real practice. So we're working with them since uh, I think four or five months. So we, we could try to bring it in that collaboration and, and uh, try to really bring it to, to practice. So I'm um, looking forward to next year, we're going to work on that uh, together with Wilanka and Annaline and Richelle to, uh, to get the app out there. And um, well, ho hopefully also to the, to, to the US through you, Indu, and, and, and try to, to get as many women in to see how it works and how we can refine it and how we get to get it into practice. Yeah. Yeah, that is so cool. I'm so excited. Well, I think, I mean, the future is bright. So even though this is a very, um, you know, sometimes people feel alone and that they're like one in so many, you know, very few people and, and, and everyone doesn't look like them. I think this sort of using technology, trying to connect people, trying to educate people, trying to engage this um, very vocal community, I think, worldwide, which we've been really inspired by, um, including Annalia and including Rochelle, Sonia, Mathur, these people that help write the papers and stuff, um, and a number of men as well that are younger. Um, you know, we're, we're really hoping to try to work together to move the needle. And this hopefully will impact not just young people with Parkinson's, but also everyone living with Parkinson's. Um, so excited to continue the dialogue and work with you. And I think we can also take knowledge from other neurological diseases that have already done some of this work in technology, yeah. migraine, um, epilepsy, some other folks. So, so I think, you know, keeping an open mind and learning from others, um, you know, is, is key in collaborating and listening to the patient voice. So thank you so much, um, Bart and Valanka, for joining us. It's just been a pleasure and the time welcome. to buy. Hopefully people can watch this as well and um, and we will hopefully be able to work with you guys to disseminate surveys and um, other sorts of research projects moving forward. But best of luck to you. Yes. I'm so excited that you have this great um, colleague there who is motivated because of her, her, her own granddad. It's a beautiful reason to be motivated. So um, best of luck to you. Thanks. Thank you. Andrea, nice I'm going to pass it too. back. Yes. And uh, I invite everyone to turn their camera on uh, for some eye contact across the airwaves. I saw we have people in Chiapas, Mexico, North Carolina, Florida, the Netherlands, Chicago. Uh, we were here together learning, um, getting excited about hope for the future. And it was a wonderful hour today. So I invite everyone to close with a wave of gratitude for our speakers and for Indu. Thank you all so much for joining for your excellent questions and the excellent presentation. Bye now.